Shalom and welcome to our Israel Vision People and Places interview show. Today our guest is Rabbi Maya Leibovitz, who's the first Israeli-born ordained woman rabbi in Israel. And she completed her rabbinic studies at the prestigious Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem and is the spiritual leader of Kehilat Mevaseret Zion, a congregation that she started in 1993 with just six people. Today, that congregation has grown to more than 150 families who represent a dynamic cross-section of our local community. And Rav Maya is the mother of four very special children and the wife of Menachem Leibovitz, who is the vice chairman of the Jewish National Fund. Rav Maya, it's a great honor to welcome you to our show today. Thank you. First question, you have uh, certainly come through resistance do you think that the majority was because you're a woman? Both, because of being a woman and being a reformed rabbi. Do you want to give us some explanations? What kind of resistance? Well, Israel is a country where state and religion are one. And um, the Orthodox uh, denomination has been very, very strong, very heavily supported by stately money, uh, which is uh, money and power. It's uh, an unholy bond between politics and religion, and um, had an enormous influence on Israeli life for the first 50 years of Israel's existence. So um, one, the opening up to new denominations, non-Orthodox uh, movements has been hard for them because that means sharing both the power and the money, or at least having somebody uh, claim uh, the right to get as much or to not get anything, um, neither for them nor for us. The other is that uh, women, uh, according to the Orthodox uh, understanding, are, s are still supposed to be inside the home, uh, to do uh, the home duties, to raise the children, and um, they have no place in the major um, home of study, the Beit Midrash, nor do they have a share in the Beit Knesset, in the uh, synagogue. So to have a woman claim to, be a lead, to have a leading role within Jewish life, both at home and in synagogue, has been something that is a challenge to, uh, to Orthodox circles, certainly to Haredi. So I have been basically ignored, ridiculed, sneered by these quarters, but um, with feminism coming into uh, Israel uh, in the back door, I think more and more women, not only among the non-Orthodox movement, but also within the Orthodox movement and even within ultra-Orthodox circles are beginning to ask questions as to their share in religious life. They're beginning to say, we have a spiritual world. We have our own unique needs. And there should be no, um, no danger to, to, to men's world. And so there are women, there is a woman in Israel who is an Orthodox woman who claims to have had a religious, an Orthodox micha, uh, an ordination by, a private ordination by an Orthodox rabbi. Of course, she's not, she doesn't have a congregation of her own. But the fact that she appeared on Israeli scene is a novelty. Women are beginning to have um, minyanim, that is uh, praying um, groups of their own. Uh, girls are being called to the Torah within women's circles only, but still the fact that a woman would be calling from the Torah is something you will not see in uh, ultra-Orthodox or Orthodox circles. So there is so many new phenomena opening up doors for women. There are women who are um, what is called to anot women who bring the case to the rabbinic courts. 
they will not be allowed to sit on the courts, although in many cases they will have more knowledge than the Dayanim, than the judges themselves. But they do have the right within Orthodox circles That's wonderful. To, to study the case and bring it forward. There are women who uh, are studying to become mohalot, that is circumcisers, um, and there are more and more women in every aspect of religious life, not only reform and conservative, but orthodox, and I think even ultra orthodox. So, Israeli scenery is changing. Yeah, I would Much say that. very quickly yeah. also. Yeah. Now, Rav Maya, you know, you are uh, unique, and we know that. And you've explained so beautifully about the difficulties, but what I want to know when was the moment, because you knew all of this, when was the moment that you decided you were going to go into the rabbinate? Well, my rabbinate is not connected to uh, feminism. It's connected to my uh, personal story. Um, both my parents um, have made it out of Czechoslovakia, but without their families. And so I was raised um, as a, a tree without roots. It's symbolic, perhaps, that we are talking on a day when the new Yad Vashem is being opened. Yad Vashem, in many, many ways, is a home to me because I'm the only survivor of an enormous family who put a Yad Vashem, a hand and a, and a name, that is a memory, to an enormous family. And because uh, I was brought up without a God and without tradition and without a past and without a history and without a narrative, narrative neither of the family nor of my people, I was constantly on a voyage of finding who I was and where I belonged to and what my past was in order to be able to build my own family and build a future. So my rabbinate is really the moment where I, I happened to discover um, by chance that the reform movement allows women to go to, into the rabbinate and it it was just um, a revelation, and it, it, it signaled a, a route for me that was basically going back home, back to being Jewish and back to being a human being and back to finding my family. I've really rediscovered all the names and the roots they have taken after going into the rabbinate. So it's basically finishing a... a, a my own personal story, yeah. it's, it's coming to peace with, with who I am as a human being and finding a mission in life. You know, I, I was a teacher before and I think the rabbinate is basically a, um, a duty, a, a vision in which you pass on to the next generation. And so I, I was lucky to find the rabbinate because it, that which I have filled my life with, I can now pass on, not only to my own children, but to my, uh, my students, to my congregation. And so and th us, that's, where, tell, that's just, where I come into but the it, rabbinate. It's not only you're passing it on to your children and to those of us in the community who are connected with you and we appreciate you so much, but in Russia as well. Yeah. Explain a little bit about that. Well, I was amongst the first reform um, rabbis. I was still a student when I first went in 1991 was the first time I went to the former Soviet Union. Um, the reform movement in the former Soviet Union has become the most successful, I think, um, move, religious, Jewish religious movement working in the former Soviet Union from a beginning of nothing, you know, meeting in schlep places like, I don't know, camps and uh, backsides of all kinds of places. We've become a major um, answer to the needs of, of Jews staying in, in Russia, in Belarus, in uh, the Ukraine. And um, I started going because I'm, I was preparing uh, material for the former Soviet Union. I'm the editor of the translated uh, Siddur, the prayer book, uh, the Hebrew prayer book of Adasha Balev, Work of the Heart. And I translated the Machzor, the uh, special prayer book for the uh, High Holidays. And I wrote a lot of uh, texts for, um, for the Soviet Union. And so I went there teaching. I was responsible for the uh, Machon, which is a power professional institute, um, preparing social workers to work with the communities. And so I've had a wonderful chance of meeting them. The need was enormous. 
And at the first years, it was just us, the rabbis from Israel coming over and rabbis from America. And I was responsible for the programming of all these people and uh, for building up a, a program which is now way beyond me and not under my, uh, my hands. But, uh, yeah. And then Avishag, your daughter, is carrying this on. <laughs> Tell us about that. What is she doing? Well, Avishag is a song leader. And, um, in the congregation. Yeah. In, she's a song leader in our congregation, and she's been working for years with the youth movement, Noar Telem, which is the youth movement of the reform movement in Israel. And she's been asked to, uh, to join the camps of the youth. We have camps for adults in uh, Russia and camps for youth. And um, it, it's fascinating They come for two weeks, like people who work throughout the year just to breathe some Jewish life and be with Jews and learn and grow. And uh, Avishag has been asked to do that. And since her first camp, she's been going back and forth and she's really taken over my work. And the funny thing is, that Avishak looks very much yeah, like does. me. And so there are still the older generation remembering me and you know, asking her whether she has any relation. And we feel in the family that we've been very fortunate to, uh, it's not only Avishak, it's also Menachem, who through the uh, Jewish National Fund is going back to Russia and has been very active in the reform movement, basically in building up the infrastructure of communal Jewish life of the reform movement in the Soviet Union. So it's, it's a family um, treasure. It's really enriched our life. It's, um, you know, when, when I started going, I kept thinking, what is it I want to teach and what can I bring to the Jews who've been disconnected from their own tradition for so many years? And um, it wasn't long that I discovered that I was, I was getting more out of being there because I've never had a chance of teaching people who were so willing to learn and oh. so thankful. And you're standing, at, you're viewing a miracle at, at its being, at its happening, because it's, it's a people, you know, people coming out who've, who are not really Jewish. They have had some relations through their grandparents or aunts or uncles, all kinds of half Jews, third Jews, a quarter Jews, who remember all kinds of things, a Yiddish uh, book in the home, a blessing, some story the grandparent l left behind. It's really uh, a nation coming alive again. And it's something you don't have, you, as a human being, you don't always have a chance to see. And I, I always felt like how unfortunate I was to be born after the state of Israel was uh, begun because yeah. the generation who made the um, first Aliyah to Israel and, and, and saw the country come into being were so fortunate. So I had a chance of seeing Jewish life being reborn but, but, in the Soviet Union. Excuse me, Meridel, for asking all the questions, but I'm so interested to know this. But you're also working in, a, in another way. People in our community, a, 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 a middle-class affluent community in Israel who've lost their Judaism and somehow you found a way to reach them through their kids. Can you explain that? Well, that's a more complicated uh, situation because in Israel, because of the unholy bond of religion and state, because that which should be chosen by free will has been coerced by a religious institution, so many Israelis have turned their back on their own tradition. It's the steps of the rabbinate, the, the rabbanut, the major rabbanut, they will not step on. And, and so in the midst of the Jewish land, in the, I, we're sitting in Jerusalem, the heart of the Jewish experience, in Jerusalem you find people who define themselves as being Israeli. And that definition does not include Judaism. And it, it's, it's, it's a paradox. I mean, you live in the Jewish land, you speak an ancient language, you have a, a rich tradition, you have a moral, you have a story to give to the nations, uh, you have a prophecy, you have a future, and, and you don't connect to that. That is an enormous danger uh, to us as, as a land, because what are we and what are we doing in this troubled piece of land if, if it was not Abram who started a voyage to go to, to, to this place. So 
we've left the train that Abraham boarded in Ur Kasdim. And what I'm trying to do is to tell Israelis, you know, living in Israel just because you were born here ain't enough. No. You need to reconnect yourself to your tradition. You can choose to not be a practicing Jew. I, I'm not here to check your mezuzah, the uh, sign on your doorpost. I'm not here to check whether your food is kosher. It's none of my business. But I'm here to check that Israel's strength is there because we are a country that has reached such an enormous um, such enormous achievements in technology, industry, medical uh, care. But our, our, our strength is our tradition, is, is our Bible, is our connectedness to, to, to a message, a moral message of love thy neighbor, of be righteous, of, of, of building a nation of, of, of holy connectedness to God. And, and without that, we have no reason to be here and so that's, that's where I, I drive. I drive towards telling people it's yours. It's not the book and the, the other texts don't belong to the Orthodox. They're yours. Reclaim them. Read them. Interpret them. Reinterpret them. Quarrel with them. Fight them. We're Israel, the people who have fought with God. And you have to fight with God along your life. And then your life is so much richer on this earth. Oh, thank you for that. We've run out of time. <laughs> but it's just the beginning. We want to hear so much more. I know that you have enjoyed this. And we look forward to having Rav Maya Leibowitz with us many times Amen. in the future. So we say together, as normally we do, may God bless you in your home with shalom. And we say shalom, shalom from, from Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Today we're continuing on in our fact or fantasy portion on the Middle East conflict and we're talking about land ownership. The fantasy concerning this issue is that the Palestinians have been held stateless by the Jewish people and by Israel after it was founded in 1948 until today and by the apathy of the world community of nations. The fact is that the Palestinian people could have had a state in this area seven times in recent history. And when I say recent history, I'm talking about the last 100 years. And I'll give you some examples. In 1917, the Balfour Declaration was declared by Britain, which at that time was the most powerful nation on earth. This gave the Jews a homeland. And that declaration became the foundation stone for a later declaration uh, concerning the British mandate after World War I when the League of Nations gave the British the right to rule this area. They then carved out Palestine over which we call Israel today and gave this entire area from the Jordan River all the way west to the, to the ocean, the Mediterranean, exclusively for Jewish settlement. The League of Nations endorsed that again on July the 24th, 1922, and this was all ratified by the United Nations Partition Resolution in November 29th, 1947. And as you see on the map in front of you, you'll see how the partition plan came into being and how the nation that was originally earmarked for Jewish settlement actually was divided further into Palestinian and Jewish areas. The lighter color areas were for Jewish settlement and the darker colored areas for Arab settlement. This action was based on UN Resolution 181 and this was the mother of all resolutions in the Middle East. The Jews accepted that but the Arabs did not. And that's the big question. Why would they not accept this two-state solution? Because even down to this very day we're still talking and battling over this same problem. Next time on Factor Fantasy, I'm going to explain to you why the Arab nations would not accept the United Nations resolution that would have brought a solution to the problems in the Middle East. This is Jay Rawlings. See you next time on Factor Fantasy. Shalom and welcome to our home located on the hills of Benjamin outside of Jerusalem. Well, I'm so happy to have heard from many of our audience out there. Thank you for your letters and your emails. They're a huge encouragement. 
Question, would you like to enjoy the full number of your days? What a silly question, of course you would. We all do, we all want to live. Well, that's why birthdays are so very, very important. Don't hide the fact that you're turning 59 or that you're becoming 20 or that now you're a big teenager of 13. Celebrate, tell everybody, invite as many as you can to come in and enjoy the fact that you are alive and well. Birthdays are great because with the gifts and the cards come the wishes and the, the prayers or the best wishes for a good life. They're thanking you for being who you are, for being alive, for being here today and right now. Really, birthdays don't have anything to do with status, with professionalism, with what you've accomplished with yourself, with your degrees, with your great successes, or even with your failures. The birthday is simply celebrating you, and that's why they're so, so important. We enjoy them in our house. We have little granddaughters, and they call us, and they say, Tack, Grandma, Bubbles, little tiny children. Just whatever. They're so thrilled with what you do for them. And that's what we love about children, isn't it? They're childlike. And in a sense, on our birthday, that's the day we need to just be like a kid and enjoy. Well, we had a birthday not long ago in this very room. And one of our sons sent this adorable postcard to my husband, reminding us of our lives when they were lived out in a tiny stone village in uh, France, up, up just behind the French Riviera. His job every Monday morning was to go and get the loaf of French bread. It elicits very sweet memories. And then, what about those who are lovers? Young lovers, married one year. But what about those of us that are married almost 40 years? Well, we need to celebrate also. And we need to thank God that we've made it this far and that we still love one another and that God is in the midst of us. And then, those good wishes for just fun and nonsense and laughter and joy, the very things that oil the mechanism of life and make it all worthwhile the going through. And how important it is to remember mums and dads and grandmas and grandpas and a really kind aunt and uncle or someone who mentored you. It's a time to say thank you for being who you are. It's a time to remember. It's also a time to encourage the birthday boy or girl to get ready because things are going to even get better in the future. You see, it's a time to come alive. It's a time to let down and just enjoy being who we are. Celebrate and share. It's been wonderful to have you here. If you would like to connect with us, ask questions, enjoy our beautiful website, log on, hisstillsmallvoice.com.